Welcome everybody to the Insight Aviation Podcast. Uh, in the background right now, we're going live on Facebook. Give us just a second there. As we're getting better at this podcast, it's fighting back against us. But <laughs> I'd like to welcome everybody to Insight Aviation, where we meet with aviation professionals throughout the industry, airline captains, air traffic controllers, and uh, in today's special case, we have a designated pilot examiner and a professor at Miami Dade College of Aviation. Allow me to introduce Professor Tim Schmelzer. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Eddie. Why don't you give us a, a quick idea of just you know, what you do and, and where you are today? Okay. Um, like Eddie said, my name is Tim Schmelzer. Uh, I'm a college professor at Miami Dade College Jaguars School of Aviation. And uh, I've been here 25 years. And I have enjoyed that run for a long time. It's uh, because I'm touching the lives of people like you uh, that are out there interested in becoming an inspiring and in becoming an aviator. So we teach here in Miami, uh, South Florida is training capital of the, the country, if not the world. It's a very busy spot, very good spot. We have the complex airspace. We have great weather and it's a nice place to come to school. So uh, I, furthermore, I work as a designated pilot examiner for on behalf of the FAA, and I see what my product is out there and see what the students are doing and what they're not doing and using that to improve my product within the college classroom. Excellent. That's quite a lot. And I know you had a busy day. You said you were flying this morning all the way up to Fort Lauderdale and then down in Tamiami for the afternoon, the evening classes. Yeah, I'm a busy, I'm a busy person, and, and that's the way I like it to be. Uh, I... Oftentimes, I'm teaching seven classes a semester, as well as doing a pilot exam each day, uh, oftentimes seven days a week, and it's with pleasure. I get to be in the lives of the people that are doing their very best and just encouraging them, as well as uh, just trying to help them be sure they're safe. Uh, as a professor, I'm teaching, and as an examiner, I'm examining, and just making sure that the people aren't being certified without having the, the proper credentials and in, in, being safe. And we're definitely going to get into that. For, for our audience, uh, those of you in the Zoom and those of you that are watching on Facebook Live, uh, please make a note in the chat, in the comments. I'd love to know where you are. Are you here in Miami and Fort Lauderdale? Are you watching us from Europe or Bogota or India, wherever you might be? It kind of helps us direct our questions and answers. And so we're going to have a great conversation here with Professor Schmelzer, Professor Tim, and uh, then I would love to answer your questions as we get towards the end of our interview today. So please feel free to put them into the Q&A and in the chat, let us know where you're from. All right. So I'm hearing that we that we don't have audio. Can anybody confirm we have audio? Let me check with uh, with Yen. I hear you loud and clear. And uh, I hear video, you. So I'm going to say we have audio. Let's keep it going. <laughs> the video the video you played did not have audio. So mm -hmm. Put that keep that in mind. I don't know Maybe what that. That's means. where the issue came from because it's supposed to have audio. <laughs> so let's start at the very beginning. So 25 years with the Ig Watson School of Aviation. That's wonderful. It's, it's a very historic institution. I believe it's been around since the 60s. I, yes, I've that's seen, correct. Yeah, that's I've seen correct. pictures of DC threes with the MDC logo on the side of it. Right. Yeah, Eddie, yeah, I'm uh, 60 years old, so I don't quite go back that that far. But yeah. we do have a rich history in Miami. Uh, we've been training pilots here since 1961. The college has uh, been started in 1961, that time when we were one of the first schools. And it started up in the Opelika area at the Opelika uh, airport. Yeah, from North Campus, right? Yep, yep. And For those so, of you who don't know or not in the Miami area, Miami-Dade College is, I think, the largest country in the nation with seven campuses and over 100,000 students, something like that. Yeah, we're, I don't know exactly where we stand, but I've heard that many a times. We do have eight locations and we have, I think, 165,000 students. And it's a very, very big institution of which uh, aviation is just a small part of. Kind of a part. And that's, you know, kind of the, the good and the bad. I kind of say the same thing about Wayman Aviation, you know, where, um, where, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, well, we've gotten significantly larger, right? But it's a kind of organization where we know everyone, we know all our students and all that, but we have these large resources of something like a Miami-Dade College or some of our other partners, our airline partners. So uh, you have, uh, you know, the School of Aviation is relatively small within this massive organization, but you have all the resources. 
exactly. of such a big school, you know, the financial aid, the scholarships, and all these great things. Uh, did you yourself attend Miami Dade College? Uh, no, I didn't. No, I um, went to school in Alabama at a place called Troy State University. I went to flight school at, before that up in Florida Institute of Technology in Melbourne. All right. And then I got my master's degree in Embry-Riddle. Oh, beautiful. I, I did not know you were an Embry-Riddle grad. You know, we bleed blue and gold over here. Yeah, That's okay. <laughs> yeah. My brother, vice president of Wayman Aviation, of course, he's the, the Broward Embry-Riddle alumni rep and uh, takes every opportunity to go to, to Daytona whenever he can, relive yeah. his glory days. <laughs> uh, so, so take us back there. How did you get interested in aviation? Well, it, to start back as a kid, my family um, managed a, a cargo company who fl flew freight for General Motors. And I grew up at an airport and um, right. kind of just happened that way. And uh, it was a part, it was an operation back before UPS and, and FedEx got wound up. And what would happen is the General Motors, they would have a part shortage, uh, let's say from a carburetor up in Rochester, Minnesota and they needed to get it to an assembly line. And we would go pick them up in Beach 18s, Beach Aircraft, Beachcraft Air 18, a big radial engine oh tailwheel. God. And so we had 13 of them and we'd go pick that parts up and, and bring them over to the assembly plants. And we had a trucking company that would take it from the airport to the assembly plant. So that's how I got started. 13 Beach 18s, that's a significant operation. Yeah, there. well, <laughs> it's, it's an old school operation compared to what's going on today, but it was, you know, it was interesting, and that was a quite a good freight hauler back in the day, cargo doors and sliding pallets in there and go. Nice. So you learned to fly right there on the field? Yeah, I learned to, uh, yeah, I learned to fly, started in Michigan, and I finished in Ohio, and oh, from okay. there I went to FIT in, in uh, Melbourne. Very nice, very nice. You know, there's, uh, I find there's two kind of people that come into aviation, right? There's um, the people that grew up, grew up on the airport. I grew up on the airport, climbing the trees at Opalaka Airport. And, uh, uh, and you know, people that might have had an uncle or a parent or, or maybe their, their parent worked at the airport or the flight attendant. You know, people that have like this connection and they're back into it. And there's the people that just loved airplanes from a very young age right and uh, always had the toy airplanes flew rc planes and then they kind of come into it and they're both excellent ways of course but i kind of i see that kind of common the common trend um what was your favorite part in that training was it the independent flying up in ohio and michigan or was it the more former acad formal academy at daytona um the flying in Michigan, uh, I was, you know, sitting oftentimes in the right seat of, of those airplanes in the cold winter, nasty weather. And I was going with the pilots that wanted somebody to be there unloading the airplane when they arrived and getting the fuel and so forth. And I remember those to be very uh, powerful experiences and, and, and created who I am today. But I've always had good experiences in aviation and they're just different, you know, so I, I couldn't choose what's better, or what's not. I mean, I would have never imagined that I would have been a college professor for 25 years. I never imagined when I got out of uh, college that there would be no jobs deregulation and the market was flooded with pilots. But I ended up getting in aviation, but I worked up my way in the administration side uh, in the airline business. And I ended up uh, working for Pan Am up in New York until, right. until they went bankrupt. And so and that's, wow. how I ended, that's how I ended up here is because I had unfortunate times and people don't understand this the industry was very unstable and we've never seen it like it is today and it looks very very bright future mm -hmm. so but those were difficult times in aviation and only the people that sur uh, sort of loved aviation survived that's true that's true so you were at pan am in new york and like right above uh uh my gosh it just blinked out of my head the big pan am building right in the middle above yeah, and, uh, and grand then, central yeah. yeah yeah that that was called the um no you got me yeah, but Grand Central, uh, unless you were out at the airport. Yeah, no, I was at the airport. I was nice. out at Kennedy. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually a great place to start because people are concerned about today, right? The, 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 the industry just went through this one-year pause, right? The whole world went through this pause. And uh, a lot of people think, well, you know, should I call it quits? Is now a good time to get into aviation? But you've seen the ups and downs, and there tends to be one about every, you know, eight to 10 years. Now, you've weathered those. Well, I have so much to say about that, and I'll probably go crazy. But the most important thing is, 
it should not affect your decision because your decision is going to be made internally. If you want to be a pilot, you're going to be a pilot and there you'll find a way. Mm -hmm. So um, people start out and they say, oh, it's going to be difficult times. As soon as you reach a difficult time, they're going to go to business. And then when that happens, they don't want to be going to psychology. The fact of the matter is this industry will be there for you if you're there for you have to be prepared and be marketable. You have to do what's necessary to get the job. There will be a job there. There's a lot. We know the numbers. The numbers are scary numbers for the, the, the people that own the airlines and, and the stockholders, because where are we going to get the pilots? You know, they're saying, well, how can we plan? We're looking for pilots. And we're, we're at the college here where everybody's wanting to partner up with us. How can we get a flow of your students? And, and they're speaking to you as well. Everybody around the world wants a pipeline of students. So I don't think that anybody should look at these downturns at all, other than an opportunity for you to be in a better position, because the people that aren't sure about it are going to fall out and that will make it even better for you. A lot of these airline captains says, listen, it's a great time for me to retire. Now they're gone. Mm -hmm. And so there's, we've never seen this problem. This is a huge pilot shortage worldwide, and it's not going to get any better anytime soon because you just can't produce pilots overnight. No, no, you're absolutely right. And somebody made a really good uh, comparison to the medical field the other day, right? You don't go into the medical field thinking about where medicine is today. You're not going to become a doctor for like seven, eight years, right? It's the same thing for a pilot, but I think the return on your investment is much sooner, right? If you look at the industry today, it's not perfect. But we know that within a year or two, there's going to be the pilot shortage has become much worse and we'll we'll be seeing it really kind of bear its teeth probably in about a year's time well right now uh, all of my people that are uh, in often a lot of your graduates they're they're being hustled right now big time yep. and they're getting offers from many different airlines all at once so one of your your uh, employees i can think of specifically and one of the great instructors she's got a job offer from two airlines and she's calling me tim which one should i choose <laughs> you know, you know yeah, and this is the way it is. And even though it might not be out there in the news right now, but I assure you under under the under the, the current under is really booming right now. They're trying to scramble. The it big airlines are saying I need five thousand, you know, this and that by this time, this time they're hiring. Oh, I want a minority background. I would like this and that. They're trying their best to get whatever they can. That's true. That's true. You're absolutely right. So we have five airline partners here at Wayman Aviation, and uh, two of them have already called me like, hey, where, what, what's going on? In fact, this Friday, we have a visit from the American Airlines uh, chief pilot who's going to come talk to our instructors and our students as well. Uh, American Airlines, of course, having the, the, the big base here in Miami for all of South America and the Caribbean. So they, he alone told me that they're hiring 300 pilots this year, right? And that's at the majors level, and the regionals right behind them are hiring up because who's taking their pilots? It's the majors, <laughs> right? So you're right, the pilot shortage came back quickly with a vengeance. So it's a great time to be into it because if you're learning to fly right now, if you're just doing your first lesson or maybe you're working on your instrument or your commercial, in about a year, year and a half's time, you're gonna be at that point to be applying to the airlines. So uh, it's, it's a great time to get a start on it. Um, but let's come back to it. So you, have seen so much over your years and so you told me that you were you graduated out of Ember Riddle and the airlines weren't hiring at that moment deregulation Eastern and uh, all those right well I graduated from Ember Riddle once I went back once I lost my job with Pan Am I, I had to get a master's degree to be a professor at the college they hired me with my bachelor's degree in work experience so I got my pan my master's degree uh, after I was a professor so um, but but going to the time you were referring to is when I got out of school, uh, when I got out of my training, I had all my licenses and my certificates and ratings, and I had a four-year college degree, but there was a lot of people out there that had a lot more. We'll never see that again. Uh, we, you know, we will, uh, it was one of those things, but with work experience, with an education, there's a lot of jobs open up in this, in this industry. There might be somebody here tonight that are saying, listen, I'm wanting to log in and, and, and listen to this presentation because I'd like to come to Miami and study aviation administration of which you sent me a note from somebody that has mentioned that. So we have administration, we have pilot programs and everything else. So you find your spot, my spot is piloting, you know, and I love piloting, but there's other, other jobs there as well. But if you wanna be a pilot, you just have to start bearing it, buckling down, you know, do what's not required of you, plug into a school, uh, for example, like Wayman, 
and they will guide you. They will give you the materials necessary and you got to do the work. And, and you, it's not that you can't just sit there and expect it to happen to you. That's the unfortunate thing that I see as a professor. These people said they're a college student sitting in the classroom, but you're not a college student unless you're going through the work necessary to change your life. Mm -hmm. You need to plug in with a path, with, with, a, with a plan, and these people will put you in, 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 a, in a, a program that works. And so when you're on your own, the difficult part of that, and some people do choose to try it on their own, it's very, very difficult. It, it, you get into a, a proven program and it's like a current and a river and you're jumping in and you're doing your part and, and paddling, keeping you off the banks of the river, but you're moving and, and you have to move in those programs and you have a stage check and then you have the, you know, this, and then you have that, and then you're set up for your, your uh, practical test and so forth. And then immediately you're in the next class for the next certificate. So I'm very high on the products that are coming out of the schools in, in of which you're you are one of the best so that would be my my advice is plug into a school i i couldn't agree with you more we actually had orientation this morning uh about half a dozen students probably one of the bigger classes actually we've had considering the last year um and that's actually one of the things that i touch on in orientation is that you've got a big goal and that goal is to become a professional pilot right and aviation has a very winding path, right? Uh, you know, you talked about all the different ways you got to becoming a pilot. You know, we have students that jump from one school to another, an independent instructor, they're doing this and that. Um, and so it's really easy to get lost in the woods working your way up to that mountaintop. And so I believe the purpose of a flight school or a collegiate program like your own is to pave a path right through the woods, right? To get you to the top of that mountain as quickly as possible, as safely as possible. And, you know, we're putting down brick by brick, we've made this path. What I find, though, is that we have lots of students who want to take shortcuts, right? Well, if I wander off the path and I cut over here, I can save an hour, I can save a hundred bucks. And what happens? They end up tripping, get lost in the woods, and we got to go out there and, and bring them back in, if we can ever bring them back in, right? So um, I agree with you. Well, there's some great independent instructors. Um, if you are career oriented, you, you got to hook up with a good uh, FA certified school, an academy, a collegiate program that really kind of provides the support, the support network around you to get you there. Because it's not just you know putting in the hours in the logbook and passing a check ride. There's so much more to working in the aviation industry. The network right the networking is so important the people that are in your ground school sitting there at miami-dade college you know they could end up being your co-pilots your chief pilot the guy that gives you the connection to atlas or envoy or whatever it might be it's so important i'd like to say miami-dade college is uh, uh the students are uh, come from the salt of the earth uh we have uh, i don't know how to say it they're they're certainly not uh wealthy by any means the best hardworking people that you'd ever want to meet. But I can say this, when I look at a class of 30 people or sometimes 40 people, I can assure you, I see hungry people and these people will do it in spite of the fact they don't have any money. That's what I want to say to everybody out there. It doesn't take anything but the want to, to do, to get this. So, oh, I don't have the money. Well, you can get the money. You can make the money. You can hustle and get out there and do what everybody else does. I have students that graduated from Miami Dade College that are flying A380s, they're flying 747s, they're flying for the airlines all around the world. And they, I assure you, they didn't have any money. They had no money whatsoever, but they had the desire to do so. So if you don't think you can do it, that's the problem. You can and you will if you just get started. You gotta jump into it. And if it takes a little bit longer, so what? You're doing what you wanna do. And this is a big message I have is you gotta do it. You can do it. And you have no idea the relationship that I have with these kids after I encourage them through those times where they didn't believe in themselves and only for them to say, I did it, I can do it, and you can too. And they're going to be a guy here tonight to, uh, in my class that will be speaking to the kids saying the same type of thing. So you guys, if you're not hearing that message, you can't do it. You're not talking to the right people. I assure you, it isn't easy. No one has it easy. Even the people that have the money don't, it is not easy, but they can do it. And you can too, 100%, guaranteed 100%. So be willing to do what's necessary to change your life. Don't sit there and hope. And you got to do before you can be. So I am encouraging you to get going. I like that. You got to do before you can be. That makes a lot of sense. You got to show up for life, right? Exactly.
And I gotta say, you're absolutely right. As I think back to all the wonderful Miami Dade College students we've had over the years, we've been Miami Dade College's flight training partner now for a little bit over eight years. And uh, I can think of plenty of students that the reason they joined Miami Dade College is because they, they came from, from poor means, first generation Americans, you know, trying to, trying to make it here. And what's the biggest thing? And I see this constantly here in Miami, right? A lot of people, my first experience was that first flight when I came to the United States. I came with my family from Peru, from Colombia, from wherever it might be, on Eastern Airlines or American, wherever it might be, and that's kind of what inspired me. I've heard that story a ton of times. And so these first generation families breaking their backs, and yes, being a pilot is not, not a, a cheap career, right? But at the same time, it is very much on par with most professions and you have amazing return on your investments, especially when you work with somebody like Miami Dade College, which has gone out of their way to provide and to find and secure great scholarships for their students. And I'm constantly amazed how many people don't do the one page essay that they need to get a scholarship from the Greater Miami Aviation Association, Ike Watson or the Timothy Johnson. Uh, I always like to think back, and I tell the story all the time of Odie. I don't know if she's watching here today. I hope you are, Odie. But, you know, I know that her family pulled together and got her through a private pilot license, but she was so good at scholarships that I think just about everything else after that was covered in scholarships. Yeah. Even helping yeah, other so, people in the scholarships. So Miami Dade College, uh, Ike Watson School of Aviation, we have two of the scholarships Eddie was mentioning, and these scholarships were given by very generous aviators and very generous people that have endowed this program. And this lady that uh, Eddie was talking about, she won four, I think, or three or four. And each one of them were eight, eight or nine or ten thousand dollars. So she won probably about thirty thousand dollars. Well, she didn't win; she was awarded it for her hard work. So there is money out there. Uh, the problem is people have to plug in. The problem is people have become conditioned to expect somebody to call you at home and, and say this is for you. No, it isn't for you, but it's there for the work if you want it. You got to you got to go out and get it. Sure. So. I don't know where you're sitting right now, but I do know that if you have this burning on the inside that you want to be a pilot, well, let's get up and get going. Uh, you got a great spot here in South Florida, Miami Dade College. Wayman Aviation is an excellent flight school, uh, international flight school. I, I've been in meetings there with, you know, 200 people, and I've seen instructors that are just top rate. So you have places to plug in. So I'm encouraging you to believe in yourself. There's a famous scripture that I hear. I've heard and I repeat oftentimes, you can do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine according to the power at work within you. So let's get going. Let's believe in yourself. Step out there, get the book, get the videos. It's all free. Almost everything's online and wow. get get going. And next thing you know, you're you say, man, I can do this and plug in, call a provider, call the college, call Wayman and get going. And, and literally don't believe this stuff. Oh, you'll never get that kind of money. Oh, you can never be a pilot. It's, it's a very challenging job. You have to have be perfect in math and all this stuff. I hear all that stuff. You know, isn't that amazing? The glasses. I still hear the story that you need perfect vision. I'm like, well, <laughs> you're not flying F-14s, you know, for the Air Force here. You can have glasses. I've had glasses since I was eight years old. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, passion. It comes down to passion. You've got to want to be a pilot. You've got to want to put in the hours because it's not easy, right? It is early mornings. It is late flights. It's these five, six hours, sweating it out cross countries. Uh, well, I don't know if you can say that, Eddie, because I think once these kids get in the airplane, you know, we've hear, we've hear the, the moaners, we've heard the complainers, and they're in, they're in every group. But 99% of these people are just jumping out, out of bed in the morning. Wilbur and Orwell Wright said, I don't remember which one it was, but they said they get so excited that they can't wait to get out of bed in the morning. These people are jumping out of bed and getting going. These kids here at Wayman in these schools and the college the ones that are going to make it are the ones that are just so excited and they can't get enough information. And if that's not you, maybe you need to get into an introductory flight. Maybe you go call, call go over to Wayman or go to a local school where you are and get an introductory flight. And if that doesn't do it for you, well, maybe you're not in the right business. But I can't imagine you not just falling in love with it. Aviation piloting is very, very exciting. I mean, to see the view from what you see at that, it's, it's un unbelievable. It's a daily challenge, it's something you learn about, it's physical, it's mental, it's spiritual. It's a great way to spend your days, absolutely. Um, so you, you have the right, the, that's the right track there with discovery flights. This is something that I, I share with absolutely everybody I meet. Every father, mother that comes in with a young daughter or son, I was like, have you done a discovery flight? You know, it's, it's so you can do a half hour for like usually like 99 bucks. We do a full hour for 179, you fly down the beach. 
go to your local airport, whether you are in Ohio or in Columbia, wherever you might be, if it's possible, if it's nearby, just go and do that discovery flight. In that one hour, you'll know if you love it or you hate it, right? And if it's not for you, you get uh, uh, dizzy, motion sickness, things like that, for every pilot, there's 50 jobs in support, right? That's a number I got from uh, Miami-Dade Aviation. Uh, for every pilot, there's 50 people in support, operations, airport administration, scheduling, dispatchers, mechanics. It's a huge field to be in, um, especially uh, here in South Florida. For those of you that are joining us from South Florida, uh, I was just part of a GMA conference call where they had, a, a, I think, the new mayor there. And she was saying that one in four jobs in Miami are directly or indirectly tied to aviation, right? That's the tourism, the cargo, the airport itself, the largest employer in the county. Right, so Miami just lives and breathes aviation and has historically, right? Yeah, so um, Miami Dade College, right here, I'm sitting right now at the Miami International Airport campus, uh, right here on the west end of Miami International Airport. We also have a, a location, a, a facility down at the southwest Miami. It's called Miami Executive Airport, formerly known as Tamiami Airport. And um, we also have a facility that, that we partner up with the Wayman Aviation up in Opelika Airport. So we have a we have a great spot for training and, and Wayman offers a great program. We pair up with Miami Dade College. So whether it's here or anywhere, plug in, plug in. There's a lot of a different associations. You have the EAA, Experimental Aircraft Associations, the Air, AOPA, Aircraft Owners and Pilot Associations. These websites are for you to get on there, free videos and free information. You can join this FAA safety team and I'm, I'm an FAA safety team leader for 16 years. And I can assure you plug into those things and they're free. And you're gonna meet people that are very experienced pilots, very passionate about what they do, willing to help you in any way possible. Plug in, faasafety.gov, great spot, aopa.org. EAA.org. Those are three nice spots to start. You know, it's an interesting time because, you know, back in the day, if you were interested in aviation, you, you had to go to the airport. You had to go hang out at the FBO, wash planes, you know, until somebody offered you a ride, basically, right? Go to the airplane spotter spots. But it's never been easier to go online and get information, right? This podcast coming to you, you might, you might be going for a run right now or sitting in your car and, you know, hearing from world-class professionals. And uh, I'm glad to say that I see them all the time from Jason Shepard and AOPA has some wonderful podcasts. It's never been easier to get that information and get started into it. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, I also also want to say shame on us, not not me and Eddie, but shame on aviation in general. You know, since the terror attacks of 9-11, the fences got big. It's true. And they're shooing away people from the airport nowadays like they're criminals. And so we have a lot of room. We have a lot of work to do to start um, uh, somehow making a bridge there. Uh, it's very unfortunate that these people only can go. They can't sit there and watch takeoffs and landings like we used to as kids. Eddie and I'm sure his family and I did as growing up, just sitting there at the airport watching planes just take off and land. I take my little boy over to the runway, you know, only spot that I can find to see them, you know, doing such a thing. But we need to do more and we need to do it uh, earlier uh, as much as we can. Certainly, uh, Wayman Aviation is very involved in, in the safe, uh, the big local uh, bringing the children to uh, the industry and so forth. So there are ways. And, I, and if, if you haven't found the ways to plug in, you're just not looking hard enough. There, there should be more, but they're out there. You're right about the fences. I can't tell you how often uh, I get a call like, oh, yeah, just come and meet me. You know, here's the address. Like, is there security? Do I, do I have to go to like a checkpoint? And I'm like, no, it's not Miami International. The vast majority of airports in the country, I'd probably say you know, upwards of 90%, are general aviation airports. We can drive right in, visit the FBO, you know, visit a flight school. Uh, Miami International, uh, Fort Lauderdale International, yes, they've got a lot of security, but even they have designated viewing areas where you can, you know, go take a, take a sandwich and watch the airplanes uh, uh, take off and land. I love on the south side of Miami International. What is it? Um, El Dorado. No, the restaurant. Oh, 94th Aero Squadron. 94th Aero Squadron. What a great place. What a great place, right? You could just watch the A380s and 777s coming in and out all day long. Uh, that's a, a, a tradition of airplane spotting that I think really needs to be picked up. But you hit on something that actually lines up with a question in the chat from Alejandro here. 
ask about mentorship. You said about getting out there and meeting people that will give you a, a hand up. And he wants to know if you had any mentors coming into aviation. Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody, you know, when I look back at my life, you know, for, let me just say this. Everybody in life needs help at one time or another. Sure. And if you're not doing that yourself, that's very unfortunate because I can't imagine where I'd be today if I didn't have people willing to go out of their way to help me. And I just, I just am so grateful for the people that did that. Um, I didn't have anybody. I, it pains me to think um, what happened to me early on in my life. If I would have had somebody, my parents kind of were of the school of just kind of you're on your own, go do your stuff. And, and there's, there's something to that, but there's also something, maybe they were too close to me to, for me to listen to them anyways. But if you get out there, I assure you will be inspired by these people out there, the lives that they've shared and they, they can share with you that the lives that they've lived as a professional pilot, they're everywhere. And these people won't shut up. They'll tell you so much about it and, it, and they're willing to help you. And oftentimes, many of these people have airplanes of their own and, oh, come on over on the weekend and so forth. We fly here and oftentimes they're going to have this Taco Tuesdays is a lot of uh, very popular. It, yeah, a lot of these these groups are going to fly to a local airport, you know, not local, maybe an hour away to get a taco or something like that. So I did have mentors, um, but I didn't have somebody like I feel that I'm offering right now because I'm I'm the kind of guy that I'll grab a hold of somebody. I'll say, listen, you're not doing it. <laughs> you know, I'll tell it like it is. I don't I don't soften it all. I mean, matter of fact, I'm very blunt about it. I tell these people, you're not doing the exercise necessary to change your life. And until you do, you're just making excuses. And that's very sad. And I don't want them to live their life that way because they go from 19 and 23 and next thing you know, they're 31 and they're still struggling. Well, because they didn't put get to work. Yeah. So I did have mentors, but um, I didn't have a college professor that was right there and, and telling me the way it is. And I, and I feel that I'm doing that and, I, and I'm and i getting a lot of uh, feedback from it. And sometimes it's, it's pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. And I think uh, we all need to be honest with one another and say, listen, right now, the way I look at it, you're failing miserably. And, well, really? Yeah. Oh, I got good grades. Well, you're not doing the things necessary to become a professional. You might have good grades, but you don't know what you're talking about mm -hmm. and things like that. So mentors are super, super important and plug in. You know, I know you've mentored many, many people over the years and in and, and the people I associate with also college is full of oftentimes it's a classroom where they're not so engaged, but I am in uh, the very best of the best are, are really wanting to know you and what your hopes and dreams are. And we're willing to do whatever we can to help you, you know, yeah. reach those dreams. So find a mentor. Uh, this is a time of year. I was wanting to say, this is a time of year that hopefully all of you guys have been applying for internships, summer jobs. Mm -hmm. The economy is, there's jobs everywhere. I, I, in the elevator here at the airport, I see they're hiring fuelers, $500 sign-in bonuses and stuff like that. Wow. We've never heard of such a thing. And this is a job at the airport, the Miami, airport is always hiring like eddie wayman says that listen there's yeah. one in four jobs are aviation related directly or indirectly i think there's thirty thousand people working at miami international airport alone they there's so many country. jobs yeah it doesn't matter I, I'm sorry for carrying on eddie please go ahead it doesn't I'm sorry. matter if you're handling baggage just being at the airport showing up at the airport every day smelling the jet fuel it gets you going and you're right about the fearless feedback you sometimes you gotta call people out, right? There's some very smart people that are taking their training, but they're not putting in the effort, or maybe they have all the opportunities in the world, but they don't have that passion in them, right? And when you see that spark, when you see somebody that's really into it, man, that's the person you wanna reach out and help. Like, what are you doing? Get going. Yeah, you know, I, like I've said all to my students on every day, the first or the first day of class, I, I said, it doesn't matter what you got, it matters what you want if you're willing to work for it. And I believe the people that are watching this are willing to work for it. I really do believe that. And that's why I'm here today is because there is a way if you're willing to work. Now, that's why you plug into these web, these uh, podcasts and so forth. That's why you plug into these schools and the, the universities and so forth, because they, like uh, Eddie Wayman was saying, they've created that pathway. It will help you avoid a lot of the pitfalls associated with, you know, trying to do it on your own. If it was easy to do it on your own, everybody would do it. There, yeah. these, these facilities are there for a reason. They serve you, and it, it's super, super important. Will you pay 10% more? Maybe. 
But if you study, if you study before every lesson, I can save you 30% of these dollars that you're hearing up there. Everybody says, oh, it's so expensive. Well, just do your part and you can save a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. Being prepared is the most important thing you can do as a student, as a pilot. Being prepared is just built into the DNA. We, we pre-flight, we flight plan, we check the weather. We don't, you've got to be prepared for your lessons, and that includes looking at your maneuvers and all that good stuff. Um, now, you mentioned EAA and AOPA. Are you involved with any of the, the pilot organizations, like uh, the ones that are out there, OBAP, LPA, all these things that are out there? Well, I, I've been a member of EAA and AOPA, of course, my, my whole life. Um, uh, as far as being involved, I can't say I'm involved with them as much as I, sh I am a member of the EAA chapter at Tamiami. Sure. Uh, I, I'm not actively involved with that because my activity is very fruitful at, within the college. And so that's where I devote my um, free time. I can find much more, I can find better ways to plug in, uh, get my students plugged in. But I'm not saying they're not good. By all means, they're super good ways to get started. Uh, well, if you're at a small it. little town, you can join a local chapter of the Experimental Aircraft Associations. They've made their airplanes. They're flying every day. These guys are my age, and they would love to share with you what you, they did building their airplane. They'd love to share with you that empty seat. Oftentimes, these guys are lonely. Maybe their wife doesn't like to fly. I don't know, but they're they're constantly looking for somebody. Hey, let's go fly. I'll be glad to take you. There's a ton of organizations out there. EA is definitely the biggest. Uh, along with AOPA. Um, so what I mentioned there was the LPA, Latino Pilots Association, OBAP, Organization for Black Aerospace Professionals, the 99s for women, and of course, women in aviation. But there's some that are a lot more local, like the Florida Aero Club uh, does a really good job of organizing flyouts to get Taco Tuesdays or to go get a hamburger or a pancake breakfast somewhere. And I know that the, the president of the local chapter, uh, he's been doing was having have a bunch of young people come over, wash the plane, and you get a ride. Like, that's the way to do it. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely a way to do it, you guys. Uh, if you want to be a pilot, do what pilots do. Hang out at the airport. If you hang out at the airport, I can assure you those opportunities will happen. The best place to go, go to a, a local airport and just say, hey, listen, I'm interested in flying. OK, well, let me tell you about this. And they'll sit you down. They'll walk you through that place. But, but I don't have any money. That's OK. We would love to share with you what we do. Mm -hmm. And it go, goes from there. So if you stay at home and you do nothing but play with those games, I find it to be a big problem that these people are, oh, I, I got my flight simulator game. Well, great. That's great. And it, it doesn't help you as much as you would think initially. It will help you later on. But get plugged in for an introductory flight. Get plugged in in a private pilot course. Get that pilot certificate, the first certificate, the private pilot. And then that instrument training, that flight simulator will be priceless. But, you know, if you're sitting there and, oh, I'm just practicing on my flight simulator, well, it's better than nothing. But it's not as good as it could be. Get plug into these schools and get going on the private certificate, and then that stuff will kick in even more so later on. What's your what's your point of opinion on that, Eddie? Well, no, I agree. I think flight simulators are a great way to get uh, into it, especially when I see younger people, you know, 13, 14, still too early to get into an airplane, but they spend their time there. I always refer them to the Civil Air Patrol, to those kind of things, just to kind of be around airplanes. Um, but I'd love to switch gears a little bit because you've been a professor now 25 years, Miami Dade College. I'm sure probably thousands of students have come to your classroom that are successful in all different kinds of way in aviation. But over the last few years, you took on a new challenge of being a pilot examiner. Right. What was that transition like? I mean, I'm sure it's very rewarding to see the other end of your training. Yeah. Well, so uh, a colleague of mine says, I see it full circle now, don't I? So I see him coming in as not knowing anything. And then I see him coming in professing to have what it takes to be a professional pilot. And so being a professor for 25 years, I know what they don't know. <laughs> and um, and I know it's usually the things they don't know requires a little bit of effort. They know the easy stuff. I love to encourage my students say, say, listen, this is, is hard, but it's not that hard. You're going to need to know it. So get it now and spend the time now because you're going to be stopped, guaranteed, if you don't get it. So as an examiner, I'm excited when I see them come in and I am excited and I know right where they are and I understand their emotions and so forth. And, and over these years, I've developed the ability to work well with somebody that's a young person trying to learn to fly and so forth. And I can encourage them at the same time. I can also uh, say that they're not ready. Sure. You know, so um, 
I, I'm loving this job because it's all about safety. I'm the last step in the safety chain, I guess it would be. The, the pilot uh, instructor, the student pilot's instructor said, you are now acting as pilot command and I'm sitting with that person as a private pilot and he's exercising that privilege and I'm just making sure he it can fall within the standards that we've established to be safe. And so my pass rate is very high because of schools like Wayman Aviation that you guys have high standards and you can't get through the, the different stages without being held accountable. Now, it doesn't mean somebody at one point or another won't get too nervous and not be able to perform real well. That happens. But most of the time, the students I get are, are ready and, and they do well and they meet the standards. I don't expect them to be perfect. The FAA, we don't expect them to be perfect, but they fall within the aeronautical certification standards. Yeah. So um, oftentimes uh, what I do find when they do fall short, it's oftentimes on things that are surprising. It surprises me to think that they don't know what if, you know, I, I, I would, when I'm an instructor, I want everybody to know, well, what would happen if, what would you do if this happens? Well, man, and if they don't know that, that's a concern for me. Oftentimes very simple things. Well, what would happen if the radio doesn't work? Yeah. I mean, well, that yeah. should be the pilot obsession, right? I mean, like you get paid to, to land and take off while you're flying. You've got to be thinking, what if this happens? Where's the nearest airport? What if that happens? What if this happens? Yeah, That's yeah. A constant it, thing going through a pilot's mind. Yeah, and, and you know, if you look at that instrument panel and you can't tell me if that's working or it's not working, and you can't tell me what's wrong, I, I say to these people, it's really it's really scary when something happens, but it's it's really, really bad when you don't know what to do. That's true. You know, I don't want I don't want to say it's scary. It, it, it can't it, it will get your attention if something goes wrong. But what's really bad is when you don't know what to do. I hear people saying, oh, my um, alternator failed and um, I'm going to have to I'm, I would have to make a forced landing because my engine will quit. <laughs> so, you know, things like that. What if sure. what if in your instructor? should be saying, what if, what if this happens? And what if that happens? Because I don't want you making a landing in a field somewhere if your radio goes bad or if your alternator fails or, or things like that. So I really enjoy that to, to, to make sure that these people are safe. And I ask them, well, you know, this is not guaranteed to always work. What would you do if this happens? Oh, you know, and I better hear them come right back. Well, this we have the magnetos, that's the ignition system. We don't need the electrical system. We'll lose our radios, but our engine's gonna run just fine type of thing. That's right, that's right. It's it's really interesting because, you know, it's examiners, I remember, I forget who it was described to me that examiners should have high pass rates. If you have an examiner with a low pass rate, that's where you have to watch out because I had one examiner come to me. Uh, we had a, a, a string of, of students who just weren't cutting the grade and he came to me, he's like, look, I don't come here to fail students, right? Like, what's going on? Let's get this fixed. And uh, I, I thought that was a wonderful way to go about it, right? You're there to, to verify they're safe, that they've put in the time and the study, and they know and they know their stuff. And you're just there to say, yeah, your instructor did a good job. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, at the end of these exams, um, uh, we have that debriefing with the instructor. And oftentimes, I'll seek out the chief pilot if I see something that's continuing more than once or twice. But 99% of the time, you solve it right there. After the exam, that you tell the instructor that this happened and the student was right there and you say, well, this is what felt, how where they fell short of the standard. And the instructor says, well, thank you for sharing that with us. We'll fix this and so forth. It can happen. It can happen. But what we're looking for is trends. And we speak those clearly to the schools and, and so forth to stop that and say, listen, maybe this class didn't get it for whatever reason. But yeah. you're right. Uh, when I get these people... Uh, a high percentage of the time, uh, I, I see. I see that they're doing great. Have you ever had one of your former students, someone you had, someone had ground school with you, Mavide College, and then in, in the oral, you're like, "Come on, we went over this." <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I just maybe a couple months ago, the guy was at a great school, mm -hmm. and I sat down with this kid, and he was an airframe and power plant mechanic. Oh, nice. And he did not know systems. And I oh. said, "Buddy, you you learn you let I me." Mean, he, you know, this is what I say. Oftentimes, it, it, the nerves just sure. make people go blank. So sure. I gave him credit for that. But yeah, I said, I know you're supposed to know this. I know you were taught this. So you're, you're not getting by me on that one because I, I shared it with you on several occasions. Not only do I have a theory class, but I have a lab class that follows that class 
where we sit down hands on and go through these things. And so he's seen it from me twice and he's seen it from the instructor and so forth. So there's no, I don't have any, it's not hard for me to fill someone when they're, when they're not prepared because I know their family would want it. I don't want to have that in my conscience if they're not ready, they're not ready. Right. So, but, but it is a high percentage of the students that do pass. Yeah, and they should. By the time they've gotten their instructor sign off, you know, our instructors are super proud when they get their gold seal because they've put in the work with their students to get them there, right? Gold yeah. seal, for those of you who don't know, mean you get 10 passes and you have to have your total pass rate, I think, above 90%, 80%, I forget right now. But uh, it's the, a great goal for every instructor to have. And uh, so we've got some interesting questions as we're coming to the end of our hour. Uh, Steven over here wanted to know if you see any, if you as an examiner now, if you're seeing any trends, anything that uh, your typical private pilot kind of needs to focus on. Well, I certainly see a real big one, and, and it's a part of my exam where I really have to drive home how important personal weather minimums are. Um, remember, you will get a certificate, and, and, and the instructor will know that he is not no longer going to be there to to um, watch over you and care for you and, and help you make the decisions. And so what I'm looking for when you come to see me is I'm looking for somebody that's very decisive. Here's my personal weather minimums. I can't fly today. <laughs> what do you mean you can't fly? Well, because I have determined that with this much experience right now, my crosswind component is, is eight knots and it's 12. Or my ceiling is should be 4,000 and, and right now it's not. You know, and things like that. I really want to see somebody that's going to be responsible for their decisions. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and I don't see that so much. And, and, and it's not from, um, it's something that I, I talk to the instructors about. It's getting, getting much better. Um, other things, uh, trends. Um, I really, I, 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 it's not, I couldn't say it's a trend. But what really, really bothers me is uh, fixation in the, into the cockpit. Oh, yeah. uh, it's a really big concern of mine. Um, we're in a very complex airspace down here, very good place to train because of that. But you have to be looking out the window. This is a this is a private pilot check ride I'm giving. And if you're not looking out the window, I don't think you're safe. And they're looking at this. They're looking down there. They're looking at their heading and they're looking at their altimeter. And I commend them because they're trying to do real well. But you're not. You're dangerous. And if an instructor is allowing you to do that, they are dangerous. You know, it, it, it's a habit that forms early on and it's very hard to break. So we're looking reference to the horizon. We're looking outside, we're doing clearing turns and we are being very safety conscious. So those are things, two things right off the bat that come to mind, I, it, that bothers me. That really, really bothers me. You know, that makes me think, I'd love to get your take on everyone's favorite uh, EFB for flight. Right? It's become uh, like a standard tool in the cockpit. We use it extensively here. But I find that when I fly with it, especially immediately around the airport, it gives me anxiety because I see all the TCATs. I see the traffic right on there. You see the traffic on your GPS. And it's almost easy to kind of get uh, distracted from that rather than looking outside. There's all these airplanes flying around you. Well, you know, I kind of must admit, I learned a lot from you years ago. Uh, I, I don't remember how it came out. Uh, I think it was, I don't even think you said it directly to me. Uh, and I think it was uh, more so what you were teaching the students uh, at, at Wayman. And just do do west of the Opelaka facility in, in the Hollywood North Perry facility that you have your operations. Sure. There's a practice area and this practice area is like you were just saying is full of traffic. Busy. And, and when you look at, if you got your head down and looking at your iPad or your phone or whatever the case may be, you know, they show, you know, your ring might be two miles, five miles or something like that. So are there in your ring? Yes. And should, but sh and should that alert you just maybe so, but it's only for a split second. Don't try. I don't even want you to really use that as very much as you probably are. Cause I really want you to say, okay, I see that person there. And I see that person there. And maybe if it vibrates on your leg and it would give you something or goes to your headset, maybe a quick glimpse down to where you should be looking if you didn't see it, something like that. But there is good and bad in that. Uh, oftentimes I see people having to put uh, 
they have to tell the tower they're they're eight mile eight point five miles southwest. I mean, really, you know, the, you know, and so forth. So I think it goes a little bit too far. But as you progress off uh, from the the private up into your instrument training and so forth, it, it becomes a more powerful resource to have. But it, you have to remember where you are in your training. But a private pilot certificate is visual. It's it's nothing but looking outside the airplane. That's true. That's true. And sometimes I encourage people to, you know, as as, as great of a env learning environment as South Florida is because of our Bravo airspace, I encourage you to go out there and, you know, try glider flying, right? Uh, I remember I got my seaplane rating in a Piper Cub, no radios at 500 feet, right? It was a totally different kind of flying, right? Like you're almost off the grid. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really interesting. And uh, I remember my brother was big on taking people, this is way back in the 90s, taking people down to Homestead to fly gliders, um, I think right before or right after their solo, because uh, he just thought it was really important for them to, to, to not just experience the, the silence, but the, the really feel the wind, right? And what happens in a real stall and to use that stall uh, like glider pilots do. I haven't had a chance to do that. Shout out to Captain Nelson. He wants, he was telling me to go up to Vero Beach and do some glider flying with him. I think I'm going to have to take him up on that. Yeah. Have you yes. gotten out of the mainstream into kind of like quirky flying? Well, I too got my seaplane rating uh, right. like you. Uh, a lot of fun flying. Um, I like flying tailwheel airplanes. Certainly, um, I haven't, that's, that's a problem where I'm, I'm trying to resolve. Matter of fact, uh, it's, I'm, I'm wanting to be able to offer more of that and i have um, matter of fact i'm sitting next to one of my uh one of the sharp one of the sharpest students i've ever had he's here technically helping me do this Thank and you. he's helping me yeah he's helped graduate of the program and he's helping me create a way so i can offer rides not not for not not for um charge you know not for that but just to to get somebody to see this quirky stuff where you can that, that's kind of the things that set the sparks off when the kid gets in an airplane that's open cockpit. Wow. Yeah. You know, stuff like that's like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I do. Uh, and I did, fortunately, able, when I was growing up at the airport, I had all those opportunities to fly. You know, uh, matter of fact, when I was in college in Alabama, my boss had all old war, old, old, old warbirds I got to fly. Nice. everything except his p51 so ah, i you know i've got to fly i got to fly almost everything so i'm very fortunate that way yeah that's one of the things uh, again getting out of the immediate airspace when you join these these clubs and you're flying out to arcadia and winter haven and labelle every little hangar has like some beautiful airplanes like wacos and pits and all sorts of interesting flying out there uh i feel like when you're in the flight school environment yeah it's a bunch of cessnas and pipers and you get lots of time on them. They're very reliable. They're great training aircraft. But the true aviators, when I see a resume, when I see a resume and it says on their seaplane rating, tailwheel endorsements or glider, I'm like, okay, you're not just a pilot. You're an aviator. You're really getting into this. <laughs> yeah. Flight training, um, if you don't keep your situational awareness, you can get pulled into it. And it can be very, it, it can be very, it could almost at, at a point drive the fun out of flying because you didn't, you didn't manage it. Like he said, like Eddie was saying, you have to go plug into those other parts are fun. Flight training can be challenging and, and, and you are doing what you're told to do and you're doing lessons. And oftentimes you wanna have the freedom to do whatever you wanna do. Well, plug into like uh, Eddie Wayman was saying, plug into those things that you can plug into on the weekends, maybe pick up a seaplane rating, maybe just fly in the back seat of somebody flying that has a cool airplane at the, at the, right. the local airport. Mm -hmm. That all comes from hanging out at the airport, right? That's what it comes That's down it. to. Go hang out at your local airport. Uh, Tim, we're kind of coming to the end of our hour. So I'd love to know, how can people reach out to you or learn more about Miami Dade College's aviation program? Okay. Um, certainly you could, my, my email is T Schmelz. It's T S C H M E L Z at mdc.edu. You could um, also look at the Miami Dade College website and look at the uh, Ig Watson School of Aviation and find all of us in there. Uh, I, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm willing to help anybody. <laughs> Other than that, um, I, I, I give my students uh, my phone number. 
I'm afraid if I gave it to this, the thousand yeah. people that are watching this would. Your email is already probably going to blow up. But I would yeah. suggest everybody, um, I believe it's mdc.edu slash aviation, but just Google MDC, as in Miami Dade College and aviation. You're going to come right to the Miami Dade College School of Aviation's website, right? And you'll be able to see, uh, yes, it is mdc.edu slash aviation. I just checked it. Um, it's a great historic program, pilot program, maintenance program, airport management program. Uh, I know I'm missing more, right? You've got logistics. We have an H air traffic control program that the controllers are, you know, filling the whole towers of the United States. It's a great place to plug into. Uh, we have international students, as Eddie Wayman knows, oftentimes they're coming from one of your programs. So Miami Day College is a great place to start if you're wanting to get an education. We strongly recommend it because these airline pilots do require a degree. Uh, the regional airline pilots don't. Uh, so eventually, uh, it will probably get more and more competitive in the degrees. The degree is super important anyways. It, it, it really will make you uh, more respected in the industry. Absolutely. I mean, if you're going for the majors, if you want to be that chief pilot, the head of operations, you got to have the degree with you. And a lot of people that want to be pilots, they, they, they think they're going to go into being a pilot because they don't want to go to college. But guess what? Everything you study, it's airport operations, you take a class on aircraft systems, you take a class on regional operations. So, you know, no one's going to make you read Russian literature here. You're reading about planes, right? So it's a, it's a great uh, career to pursue. The collegiate path is wonderful. Miami-Dade College and many local colleges across the country have them. It's not just Embry-Riddle and University of North Dakota. Your local college very likely has an excellent aviation program, very often more accessible. You don't have to move halfway across the country. Um, and you know, here we have a perfect example, uh, a little jewel within the Miami-Dade College system, uh, which has provided so many. You spoke about your air traffic control program. Of course, the former director of the tower was a Miami Dade College graduate. So I think that's that's wonderful, and you will find a Miami Dade College graduates throughout the entire aviation industry here in South Florida. Uh, Tim, I'm so happy to join that you were able to join us. You've got a great energy and a great message for everyone looking to get into aviation. Uh, thank you so much. It was my pleasure, Eddie, and God bless you and your family. Thank you very much. And you. Blue skies, blue skies to everybody out there. Uh, get out there, fly, get a discovery flight. Thank you for joining Insight Aviation today.